Museum, the vestments you see were all used in Jerusalem, Nazareth, and Bethlehem, and they were used for centuries there. Many of them were paid for by the royal families of Europe in order to be remembered in the holy places associated with the life of Christ. So we have this collection by way of the Franciscans of the Holy Land. Most of these vestments are too old to be used any longer. The ones in the corner now in your view are from the late 1700s, and the background thread on those is silver thread. So these are extremely well made, but there's a limit to how much fabrics can endure. So we only use a few of them on very special occasions, like the dedication of a church or the first mass of a priest. Now across the way, I'm going to open this curtain. This is a document from 1607. The date is right there in Roman numerals in the year of 1607 of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the rules for the Society of Corpus Christi and we keep it protected from light most of the day. But this is on an animal skin, 60 lines of script, and flawlessly executed. And so you say it's the rules. Can you explain the rules for Like a, a Christian organization. Like okay. you will say your prayers every day, you will make a pilgrimage once a year, something like that. Okay. Whatever the rules might be for them. And these are Eucharistic vessels. These were all used in the Holy Land. And... Um, some of them date back to the 1700s. But because of thievery now in places that are populated with tourists, many of these were taken out of circulation and the Franciscans entrusted them to our care. But the crown jewel of this room is actually a crown jewel. This chalice contains a stone. The gemstone belonged to Mary, Queen of Scots. She was a cousin of Elizabeth who ordered her execution. And uh, it's an amethyst. It's surrounded by tiny little pearls. Above it are diamonds. And on the back of the chalice, you can see rubies. And they're in the shape of the Jerusalem cross. If you'd like to go behind to oh, yeah. fit around there and see the back of it. So these jewels were obviously not on the chalice during her lifetime, but after her death, this was created as a memorial to her. Many brides request that this be used at their wedding, and we do loan it out, we ask for a donation, and we do have to send a representative of the museum to travel with it and bring it safely back. We never ship it on its own. I've flown with it a couple times. That creates a lot of interest at this point. This is the St. Peter's room. This room uh, commemorates one of our beautiful old churches that was torn down. The sad thing is, the priest who built it in 1928 stood there on the corner and watched him tear it down in 1970. And he just told people not to protest. He said, this is the will of God. So if anything, he inspired my vocation. That's one of the things that made me want to be a priest. But these are treasures from that church, and if God lets me do it, I'm going to rebuild it someday. That's just me. This is by the famous artist Paterino. And... Um, probably one of the greatest sculptors of the 20th century. And that's the solo piece that he also did of the Blessed Virgin Mary going up to heaven. More here than you thought, huh? Yes! <laughs> and here's the whole life of Christ. If you want to just walk along, yeah. you have the Annunciation with the angel Gabriel up there, uh, the tents of the three wise men, who came to see the child Jesus. Up there is the nativity with Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. Down here, just little village scenes, wells, shops, carts, people, merchants, ovens. Then we know the flight into Egypt. Mm. So there's the Holy Family going through the gate, leaving the city. Then you come around here and there's more scenes of the town. Uh, this is the largest Fontanini collection in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, that's been confirmed by the Fontanini Company in Italy. Um, gardens, ponds, wells. There's even a little frog sitting here. <laughs> um, craftsmen, 
it was everything just to complete the city, rug makers, and look at the little rugs they made. Wow. The detail on this is fantastic. Yeah. There's a scene of the temple, and then what's supposed to be inside the temple, the curtain of the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. Over here is the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan. Mm -hmm. You can see the Holy Spirit hovering. One of my favorites, the wedding feast of Cana and the jars of water. The little tent over the married couple. And you continue, there's a mill with a donkey and other little scenes of families. Jesus teaching the children. Um, another scene, the storm at sea and Jesus walking on the water. Then, last supper. And in the back, uh, just stuck there, is Emmanuel Fontanine, the man that started this company and created all these figures. It shows him, he designed himself sitting in a shop making a figure. Then wow. finally we go to the trial of Jesus. And then of course the crucifixion. And the tomb of Christ in the back. And the resurrection here of Christ coming forth with the angel. Now, in addition, we have over 700 nativity sets. Wow. <laughs> so Christmas time, they're from all over the world, from the Far East, from North and South America. Some are large like this, and some have, this one's in poor condition. Actually, the church that had it was going to throw it out because it was damaged. Wow. Well, we've just put plants and grass where it's damaged and <laughs> laws until we get it fixed. But these are beautiful treasures. So, so each order of nuns had their own distinctive dress that they wore. And actually the nuns that taught me in grade school wore this habit right here. And I have an interesting photograph you might get a kick out of. My sister became a nun for a while, but she didn't make final vows. <laughs> but she's in this group of brides. Oh. This was taken in 1965. And that is my sister right there. A lot of time has passed, but that's the number of girls they were getting every year in the convent. Wow. And after they went in dressed as brides, they came out dressed in nun habits, and they looked like this. This is the same ceremony after they got their habits. And each one was wearing a crown of thorns for the first day to show that they wanted to imitate Christ. And there really was an order of nuns that wore that hat. That was actually the precursor of the... Um, nurse's hat. Really? That was an old field hat, and these nuns just wore that as their headdress instead of a veil. So why would they Why would they wear it like that? I mean... It, it was like a sunbonnet. Okay. And they just starched it out to protect them from the heat of the sun. Okay. And St. Vincent de Paul, who started this group of nuns, told them not to wear veils. He said, if you put a veil on, the bishop will hide you in the convent. I want you to work on the streets with the poor. So we have... Hundreds of Bibles, but some of the most interesting ones, we have a replica of the uh, Gutenberg Bible. It's in two volumes. This is one of them. The other is in the cabinet. And the seven books that Catholics have and Protestants don't have are found in the Gutenberg Bible. So when people say we added them later, I say not only did we add them later, but then we invented time travel and went back and tucked them in. No, they were there. That's a fact. Now, over here you'll find something interesting because this is a commemorative edition of the King James of 1611, 400th anniversary of the King James. And if you look through it, you'll find something very interesting, the Apocrypha. The seven books that Protestants don't use were in the original King James. So you're looking at it. So there's Esdras. Um, Tobit, Judith, Esther, Ecclesiasticus, 1 and 2 Maccabees, and Baruch. So there they are. So when they say we added them later, maybe not. Just saying. <laughs> now here's the image the Bible. This is not a reprint. This is a 1720 Bible printed in Nuremberg. You'll notice that it says, with notes by Dr. Martin Luther. 
certainly in a Lutheran Bible from that era, in the land of the Reformation, we're not going to have those seven books. Or are we? <laughs> the Apocrypha. Wow. And this is the original, you said? This is an original. Wow. Most of these are all original Bibles. Uh, the vast majority of them are Lutheran, and they all contain the seven books. The shoe of Pope Pius XII, the signature of Pius XI, a piece of the cassock of John Paul I, very rare relics of him, a letter from Cardinal Burke to our museum well, after he finished his tour, um. the Cardinal Robes of Cardinal Mooney of Detroit, and a lot of other things that belong to our local bishops and some of the early American bishops. We also have things of the popes over here, John Paul II. Oh, the hat. That belonged to John Paul II. And he sent it to us in appreciation for our efforts to preserve the Catholic mind and memory. And these are other treasures of Pope Pius XII and some of the other popes. And other things that belong to Cardinal Moon. Thank you. Fifteen oh one. That's an altar missile. Like I said, I'm gonna do the Latin Mass today. Mm -hmm. That was on the altar when Michelangelo was still painting, Columbus was still sailing, and Martin Luther was still Catholic. <laughs> so these are all from the fifteen hundreds. So it's a pretty impressive thing to have. And uh, we have over 300 books from the old Latin Mass printed all around the world, and they all are exactly the same They all have the same text in them. The church invented the concept of copyright before anybody else did. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to print a book, the church would give you a copy, but you had to read it printed exactly as it was without changing the words. You could use the name type font you wanted, you could put in art, but the words had to be exactly the same. That's how they preserve the faith. In fact, mm -hmm. when the great waves of immigrants came to this country from Europe, from all the countries and the languages there, they all had the same Latin mass. When they came over here, we mm -hmm. virtually didn't lose them because the first church they went to was a Catholic church and it was in Latin just like they left behind. But here's even more interesting. This is a copy of a famous book that's in the Vatican, the only one that exists, but the Vatican made a thousand copies of it and shared them with museums and libraries. It says, it's abbreviated, the large letters, Incipit Canonicis, which means the beginning of the canon. Sursum corda, abemus a dominum, gratias agamus domino deo nostro, dignum et justum est. That's the famous phrase, lift up your hearts, we've lifted them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, it is right to give him thanks and praise. Those words go back, this is from the late 300s. And then up there you see the S, those are abbreviations for the words Sanctus, 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 Dominus Deus Sabaoth, Plenis in Celia Terra, Gloria Tua, Hosanna in Excelsis, Benedictus Quivenit, Nomine Domine, Hosanna in Excelsis. Now, a lot of the abbreviations there are what we call non standard, but they didn't have any rules to follow. We have made them along the way. <clears throat> so the old fashioned desks. And the habit in here is the Sisters of Mercy, and they're the actual nuns that ran the school here from about 1912 till it closed in 1974. So that was the habit they wore that whole time. Now nuns would have a little fun in the classroom. This is one of their cute little jokes. It's something they would show you on your first day of Latin and you were supposed to read it. And it looks like Latin and most of the words are Latin, but watch it as I read it. O oh, see Billy, see or go, 40 buses in a row. Now Billy, them is trucks. So what is in them? Cows and ducks. <laughs> More nuns. <laughs> Thanks to Father Lutz for giving us an impromptu tour of the Jubilee Museum as we were in Columbus, Ohio. If you haven't already, give this video a thumbs up and we'd be happy if you subscribed. Take care, everybody.